All right, Ben Mang, today is Tuesday. It is February 8th. Welcome to the Dog Walk presented by Barstool Sports. Here we are, Chief Eddie, once again. Chief, how are you? I'm doing great. Doing well. Um, just grinding them out right now. I, I feel like I've done more audio <laughs> in, in the last two days than like the last three months. Combined. I know. We're grinding it out. Yeah. I appreciate you hopping on. Always. Because... At least Tuesdays. I, the draft Monday, Tuesday. It's just mm -hmm. mandatory. You need it's that. my favorite part of this job is doing this show. So, yeah. um, Well, good. I'm glad. It's not too much of a burden on you. <laughs> no. Um, Get those other guys out of here. It's just you and me. Everything's yeah. fine. Yeah. And Harry. And Harry. Before we do really get into it, though, Chief, I do want to talk about debt. I know we talked about that student debt episode a couple weeks ago, which we're going to reference again here in a second. Um, but... Upstart's there for you, okay? Because Upstart is a, uh, a service that can help you pay off your credit cards, consult, can help you consolidate high interest debt, or it can help you fund personal expenses. And over a million people have used Upstart to get one fixed monthly payment with a clear payoff date. Upstart knows you more than just a credit score. So rather than looking at your credit score alone, Upstart's model considers other factors like your income, employment, and other information provided in your loan application to find you a smarter rate for your loan. You can check your rate without impacting your credit score in just five minutes for loans between $1,000 to $50,000. And you can even receive these funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. So find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash Eddie. That's upstart.com slash Eddie. Don't forget to use our URL because it lets us know that we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Just want to stress that one more time. Once again as well, go to upstart.com slash Eddie, E-D-D-I-E, and start being smarter about your uh, about your debt right now. Do it right now. Do it. You know, pause this. Go get it going. Or listen to the episode and then go do it. But um, either way, make sure you're using Upstart. Um, so, okay. So, like we said last week, the people really liked the episode two weeks ago mm -hmm. about the uh, student debt. So, we're going to kind of try to stay within topics like that when yeah. we can. And uh, this one kind of seems to be another good one um, about the opioid crisis. Yeah. So, I think this was probably about a month ago now when I told you I watched the show, uh, the, the drama series, Dope Sick on Hulu, which I can't recommend to people enough. Like it really does a great job of personalizing and, and helping people understand on a, on a very human level this opioid crisis. And, and so I recommend that to everybody. We're not going to touch on that too much. Um, we might do that in an episode about the show later. Yeah so, yeah, so I think the plan is probably like we'll do this, obviously, if people like it and probably even if they don't, I don't who knows? Yeah. Well, we'll still do uh, an episode <laughs> in you guys. a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. And uh, hopefully everyone will, will have watched it by then. Yeah. I'll watch it by then and hopefully get on like a specialist to get even deeper. That's the plan. So also if you're a specialist and you're listening and you like this and you want to speak in person, yeah. even better if you're Chicago based and you could sit on that couch right next to the chief, mm -hmm. that would be ideal. Yeah. Um, but yes, that is the come right here. That is the plan. But yeah. today we're just going to get into like a broader in yeah, it's the broader the history of it a little bit and how we got on this path and and uh, and and kind of where it is today. We'll kind of and then we'll leave like the dope sick part of it or as much as we can like aside mm -hmm. and um, and we'll just we'll just talk about this because this is still like a it is a tragedy. And like when you get into some of the numbers, you're just like holy shit. And it's like I know it's been talked about. Um, more recently, maybe in the last three, four years than it had been before, but it, it is a crisis, like a health crisis as big as just about anything. And it all goes back to one family, the Sacklers doing it just for profit. And then, and the things that they're doing now to avoid penalty is possibly understandable but also just makes your fucking skin crawl and this is like specifically like pill type thing is what you're saying yeah okay, okay. so so the, the sackler family which owned and operated purdue pharma out of St stamford connecticut so you take you can take the train there from new york city pretty easily uh one of those coastal cities and uh that was a private company so they, it's different than some of these other you know big pharmaceutical companies that you see in the news, whether it be, you know, 
Pfizer or Moderna or places. I'm not sure about Moderna, but let's just say Pfizer. Pfizer Pfizer's publicly traded as a huge, huge company. Bayer uh, out of Germany, you know, same thing. And But the difference with Purdue Pharma is that it's really run or was run by one family uh, over multiple generations who were called the, the Sacklers. And they made ungodly amounts of money. And they were just one of these like kind of American aristocrat families where, you know, they, they're almost to like the, this is very common among like the Uber, Uber wealthy where they become like the, this great philanthropic family where they, you know, they donate all sorts of money to the Met Gala and the Guggenheim and, you know, uh, Oxford university and Cambridge university. And they have names over, you know, various buildings at, you know, Tufts outside of Boston and, they're just like one of those families where it's just like their name is so big because they've given away so much money to these different, you know, hoity toity, you know, kind of rich person yep. causes like, you know, like the Met Gala, you know, like the Met Gala, a little bit like the Met Museum and all, all that sort of shit. Like they were they're just one of those types of families. And it's I think it's three generations now. And the money or the, the family really is kind of comprised of 40 members and they're all kind of on the board and some are higher, some are lower. And, uh, the dynamics of the family are, are actually pretty fascinating too. And you had this like concerted effort because they knew the money was there to get an opioid into the market, um, and have it be like acceptable by, um, by the medical community and doctors and things like that. Cause opioids have been around for forever, you know, like, or, or for a really, really long time. Um, you know, it, it would, I would say going all the way back, uh, there's records of opioids being used like morphine. You've heard of morphine obviously, yeah. right? So that was used all the way back to the civil war. Okay. And then, um, 1898 heroin is produced commercially by Bayer, which we should probably do an episode on Bayer too, because, yeah. There's so many of like, these like brand name companies that you have heard of that, you know, like Bayer is a German company originally, right? Huge ties to the Nazi party. Like, and I guess maybe you could say that about every company in Germany at that time, but Bayer specifically, and somehow they come out of that and they're like, yeah, we're Bayer. We're just big pharma. But in 1898, they produced uh, heroin for the first time commercially, um, but it was like right away people are like, uh, this is fucked. Like we're, this is like, we're have they had like an opioid crisis in America way back, you know, a hundred years ago to the point that, uh, Congress in 1914 passed a narcotics act, which, uh, require that doctors write prescriptions, uh, for opioids. And then also like things like cocaine, like you used to be able to get cocaine with a prescription, like then they used to put it in Coca-Cola and they're like, ah, so that's actually bad. So they write that law in 1914. And then, in 1924, um, there was the Anti-Heroin Act in the United States, which bans the sale and production of heroin in the United States. So that that was like, we were talking 100 years ago that we knew opioids were a problem to the point that we had to write laws banning them. And it's not like it was with marijuana where it was just like, hey, like we got to get, <laughs> we have competition, you know, alcohol wanted marijuana banned. They had, we did, a, I think we did a podcast on this guy. Um, I'm blanking on his name right now, but he was like this newspaper tycoon who had heavily invested it in all these, um, you know, paper mills and, and f basically forests that he could use for lumber to turn p trees into, into paper to supply his own newspapers. So that guy, it wasn't, it, it was a different situation where it was just like, Hey, like this is really bad for the people in this country. Like we should not have heroin being produced. And that held up for a long time. And then, uh, you know, it was, it was listed as a schedule one drug with other things like fentanyl, oxycodone. And, uh, that was like all through the seventies. And then things started to change in the eighties. Okay. So there was a letter to the editor, um, published in the new England journal of medicine by this guy. And he said the letter was titled addiction is rare in patients treated with narcotics. And he cited like in this hospital setting, um, if you treat 
patients in pain with opioids and then like they would, you know, in a hospital setting, if they had cancer or whatever it was, some kind of long-term chronic pain that you would treat it with a low dose of an opioid and that really helped their pain. And And this doctor in this setting where he was in complete control was able to taper people off and they didn't get crazy addicted because they weren't getting that much to begin with. And they published this little short thing, letter to the editor in New England Journal of Medicine. And somewhere along the way, that was picked up and usually funded. These studies were funded by Purdue Pharma and the Sackler family. And they would cite this study all the time to get this this, hey, it's not that addictive. It's not really, these opioids are not that addictive. Look at the study from the New England Journal of Medicine. It's in the New England Journal of Medicine. It wasn't a study. It was not a comprehensive medical study. And they cited it as if it was. And then because they're so powerful, they were able to get it like taught, okay? Like, so they donate to Tufts, okay? They donate to Harvard Medical School. They donate to all these different medical schools all over the country with this idea that opioids are actually fine. They're not that addictive if it's, you know, administered properly. So they, in 1995, they came up with a time release version of oxycodone, which is a schedule one drug called oxycotton and oxycotton, you know, you, it's supposedly released over a period of 12 hours. And so it's like, yeah, like you don't get like these peaks and valleys, okay, of highs where you're constantly chasing the high because, you know, it's a a time release drug. So your, your pain is treated and you're like, your patients won't get addicted and you're fine. And, and that it, it, it it is sickening the, the levels that they went to get this process. So there was this this group out of Chicago and maybe somebody knows somebody um, it was called the American pain society. And they really were like, you know, it was this group of physicians and they're like, we don't want to see our patients in pain. We have to be able to treat their pain. Pain is a really important chronic problem. And who was that group funded by? Sacklers. Fuck. Yeah, it was. And there was, a, like a dozen of these groups all throughout the country and these different advocacy groups. And they eventually get to a point where the medical community recognizes pain as the fifth vital sign. Okay. So you had, previously you had the vital signs, which were, you know, you could really chart them. It was your respiration rate, your, uh, your heart rate, your blood pressure, and your, your temperature. So it's like, here's a thermometer. Holy shit. He's got a fever, 103. We got to treat him with this bang, bang, bang. Oh, his blood pressure is dropping. He might die. We got to treat him with this bang, bang, bang. And then it's like, and we're going to add pain to that. And it was because Sackler was funding that movement because they had this drug Oxycontin approved by the FDA and they wanted to get it out into the market where they wanted people and doctors to accept it. So if you, if anybody's been to the doctor's office, where they have that like kind of smiley face sign, zero to 10, like how much pain are you in? Yeah. You've seen that, right? Oh, of course. Okay. Purdue Pharma. Really? That sign that I think everybody who's been in the doctor's office in the last 25 years has seen that sign. Hey, point to what level of pain that you're in. <sighs> Doc, I'm a seven. Oh, okay. Well, we probably should give you this opioid, but there's no way to measure somebody's pain. No. It's just like what, you know, and different people have different pain tolerances. Yep. And, and so, That was, but it was all part of this campaign to get Oxycontin and they rolled it out in these places intentionally uh, in Maine um, and then different Kentucky, West Virginia, and then like Western Virginia. So like logging areas, coal country, where you have these people who are doing backbreaking labor down in the coal mines chopping down trees, getting, you know, hurt, getting hurt. All oh, those are high risk. Damn, so strategic. Huh? Very strategic. Holy shit. Okay. And they're also, you know, it's not if you're prescribing it to, you know, city workers in New York City and they report back on mass that like, hey, like we got to, this is not going well. Okay. It's harder to ignore those people than it is to <laughs> In West Virginia, hillbillies, drug addicts, they're all, yeah. they're all the same. And that was part of their, another part of their campaign. 
it, yeah, like, you know, we know people are getting addicted and that's, you know, really, that's a really bad thing with the drug addicts. It's the addicts. Just keep calling them addicts. Okay. So they kept trying to put the, the blame and the onus on the end user as opposed to they themselves. And they would do all these things. Like there was, they, they would, they would go in, they have these, you know, pharmaceutical sales reps. And I'm sure everybody knows people who work in pharmaceutical sales, but they would give them all this material. Okay. And the material would be like less than 1% of people get addicted to this because of the time release. There was no real data to back that up at all. So they would cite that study that I referenced earlier, which was not a study. It was just a letter to the editor and a non-comprehensive study. And even the person who wrote it, he was a doctor. I can't remember where he was from, but he had, you know, been, had over a hundred things published and wrote into the new England journal of medicine all the time. And like, he was called before like a grand jury to be like, are you aware that your study is being used um, to say and sell these, uh, you know, very dangerous opioids? And I was no, I didn't fucking, I didn't know. <laughs> is this New England guy? This is the New England, the, the guy who wrote the letter to the editor about his patients that were in a control, like yeah. under his control said, hey, like less, and he said less than 1% of my patients have gotten addicted to the, to opioids. And he's like, well, that, like that, and he was like, backpedal immediately. He's like, that was a, th a letter I wrote in 1980. So now he's being called in like, you know, early 2000s to, to testify before a grand jury. And he goes, that was not a study. He goes, I didn't know it was I'm like, uh, this is being taught as if, Hey, there was a study back in 1980, New England Journal of Medicine, which is a very, you know, well-renowned, probably the most well-renowned medical journal, medical journal in the country, if not the world. Okay. So it's very, so they would, you say, I didn't know that I was, I was literally going to ask you, like, is that still a thing? Oh, the New England journal, New England journal of medicine is very prestigious. Is that like their biggest flub of all time? That I don't know. I, yeah. but it's like, it's, it's almost not even really on them. Like it's a letter. But if they were published, oh yeah. All right. It's a letter to the, letter okay. to the editor. Yeah, yeah. So it's not like the, this, like New England journal of medicine. were not the ones calling it a study. It was Purdue pharma calling it a study. And it's like, and if you're yeah, donating yeah, yeah. to all these different institutions, academic uh, and uh, otherwise, you get to kind of craft, you have the ability to help craft um, curriculum and belief systems and things like that. Because it's like, hey, you're not teaching this. Pain is the fifth vital sign, as we've shown, because mm -hmm. we funded that whole movement. And now you should really be teaching this because no one should have to live in chronic pain. And people need to be able to treat their pain and we have the way to do it. So that was, you know, the start of how they rolled out this drug and, and got doctors on board. And they had all these different marketing materials, which they knew were fraudulent. And there's like email leaks to prove that they knew it was fraudulent. And they would like change. They would show these graphs, right, where they would show these peaks and valleys of, um, of basically of highs that they manipulated the chart to make it seem like it was pretty steady when in reality it is still you're still you still are getting the peaks and valleys then it was like well we have this coating on the outside so it's time released all you have to do is suck on it like it's an m&m to get the coating off so then people worked then it was just straight shot people were crushing it up and snorting it and all sorts of things it was highly abused basically immediately by the late 90s like it was really rolled out in 95 and by the late 90s they had people all sorts of people in those initial rollout areas were addicted crime spikes um you know all sorts of just issues that were all indicators that this is being abused and you know people would rob pharmacies break in rob pharmacies take nothing except for oxycontin and that you know it became a street drug and because it, it, it fundamentally changes the way your brain works. So like you, you like can't get off it and you feel like they say, like, have you ever seen the movie Ray? No, Jamie, Jamie Foxx, yeah, Ray Charles, Ray Charles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's this scene where he goes into rehab and I believe he was on opioids and heroin too. It's definitely on heroin and they show him in this rehab scene and it is horrifying like the shakes the you know they do a pretty good job of showing like the distress that he was in getting clean 
and it makes you feel like you're going to die. And if you do go like just try to go cold turkey and you really fight it, you actually can die Mm -hmm. just from like you have to like strategically taper off. And there are these other medications um, blanking on the names of those that will help you like, okay, you're not on this opioid. You're on this other thing. Suboxone? Yes. Yes. I think that is it. Yeah. Fucking it. See? Good pull. Uh, You know how I know that? No. Because that's what fucking Artie Lang would always take. I didn't realize he had an opioid issue. Yeah, very bad. Yeah. And and, heroin more, well, to my knowledge. Well, and that's the thing, too. So, like, with heroin, you know, it got to a point where it was it was difficult to get oxy, okay, and expensive. So, on the street, because once your prescription ended, you know, and you can't get off of it, but you can't get back, you can't continue your prescription. And... um but they did change that as well, okay? So that was like another thing. So the Sackler family, is the first they released it in 10 milligram doses. And they were prescribing it. It was like, yeah, I could give you a Tylenol or I could give you this. You know, I'll give you this. You know, you know they got, the kid did a good sales job on this Oxycontin. I'm going to give you, I'll give you Oxycontin 10 milligrams. And then they came out with a, a 20 milligram dose. So at first, everybody that was in the program getting this, getting this pill was getting 10 milligrams. Yeah. And then the the Sackler family and Purdue Pharma came up with a strategy to individualize the dosage, which just means, oh, I say my pain's in in eight. Here's 40 milligrams. Here's 80 milligrams. And it's like, then it just becomes impossible. And you're always, you know, it's like the same thing with heroin. Like the reason so many people die from heroin is because you want to get to that threshold where you're just about to overdose because that's your high. Yeah, then to my knowledge, a big thing is is when they, if they do, you know, try to recover and they get clean for a little bit, and then they think they go back and they could just take as much as they did before, and that's how. Yes. There's like an instant. Right. Um, overdose. Bang! So, you're dead. Yeah. Yeah, and, and but heroin is cheaper to produce and use. And, and that's, that's the big thing, right? Mm-hmm. Is once you, a lot of these people who are getting off of these painkillers out of these oh, oh, these oxycontins, and then they can't get it anymore, or yeah. if it gets too expensive. They go the heroin, the heroin route. exactly, yeah. which is like, cre- like horrible. It's horrible. Yeah, and it and it they they behave in your brain in a very similar fashion to heroin. Opi- uh, they're both they're just, opioids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, so they behave very similarly in your body. But it's just like the the shock system, the heroin. You don't know exactly what you're getting. Like you could get a you get, they have these things called like I think they they call them like hot doses, where it's just like anybody who takes it's gonna die. And, you know, now you're in this, in the same thing, like we're seeing this fentanyl crisis too. Mm-hmm. Okay. Where it's like, you got cocaine laced with fentanyl. You take a hit of cocaine dead. Okay. And it's just like, you just cannot fuck around with it. And then it's like, you're, you're addicted. Hey, let's take another quick break here because you know, we got to talk about Roman. So, uh, you guys know the drill by now. Um, if you're still sitting there counting the ceiling tiles if you're thinking about, you know, the dirty sock drawer, whatever you're doing, just stop doing that, okay? Because there's no reason for it when you have such a good product like Roman. Because Roman is an online men's health company, and they're changing the game with these Roman swipes. It's the secret to lasting longer during sex, okay? These swipes are clinically proven as a way to last longer in bed. They're effective, easy to use, and they're fast acting, but they don't require a prescription. Roman can ship swipes to you in discreet, unmarked packaging, and each swipe packet is small enough to hide in your wallet for whenever you need it. They're super easy to use. Just take the swipe out of the packet, swipe it on, let it dry, and you're good to go. That's it. Go to GetRoman.com slash dog walk to get your first month of swipes for just $5 when you choose a monthly plan. That's GetRoman.com slash dog walk. Start using the swipes, people. It's going to enhance everything. It's going to make everything better. You want to be better. Get better with GetRoman.com slash dog walk. All right, let's hop back into the episode. And um, and, it, and it just, you know, they, they just, they strategically caused an opioid epidemic for their own personal gain. And, you know, and it's like the things were getting leaked and they would like intimidate pharmacies. Pharmacies were like, hey, like I'm getting robbed for this shit all the time. Okay. Like my, I can't keep having my store broken into. So I'm just not going to carry Oxycontin. And then people from Purdue Farm would show up. Uh, we're going to sue you and we're going to do a class action suit of all the people in your community. Stop. Yes. 
for not carrying it because you, pharmacy, are causing them to be in more physical pain by not carrying it. So unless you're gonna, you want to deal with the mountain of paperwork and the lawsuit, get it back on the shelves. So people would just be like, uh, that's intimidating. Fucking strong arming people? Yes. And even though that's like bullshit, like it's like that they would never, they wouldn't. They never win. That. They would never win that. But they would probably they might have to go to court and like that's a cost and that's time and mm-hmm. and you don't necessarily know it's like oh me like my little pharmacy against because it's not like necessarily like it was CVS it was like these mom and pop type places yeah. like the one on Chicago Avenue right exactly yeah. yeah and like okay like I'm gonna have to go into court against you know the fucking Sackler family and Purdue Farm I better just fucking carry this thing mm-hmm. so they like really kind of thought of everything and caused this problem. And it was like the work of, you know, the DEA got involved because they were doing like these drug raids, right? And they would like open up these bags and it's like, what the fuck is this? What are all these pills? You know, and it was like, well, that's Oxycontin. That's like the new hot thing. So the DEA and then you had like the, you know, the Justice Department working on this case and they worked on it for years and years and years. And then they finally brought it and they had like a, they settled for I think the initial one was for like 300 million, but now that just kind of opened the floodgates. Okay. So they had a federal indictment, which they pled not guilty to, but had an out of court settlement for like $330 million. But then like everybody sued them. The state of Texas sued them, Virginia sued them, Kentucky, Ohio. There's something like, I think there's like maybe 40 different states like have have sued Purdue Pharma and then the the Sackler family um oh there's another wrinkle here too because they they were able to get like these this language about less than 1% get addicted on the actual label so that has to get approved by the FDA they found out that the guy in charge of approving the label wrote the language for Purdue Pharma, then after it was approved, resigned and took a job with Purdue Pharma, like immediately making like $350,000 a year to do nothing. Okay. So like they had every single angle covered and, um, to get this stuff to the market and it was a very effective, do you know how much revenue they generated off of Oxycontin? Hundreds of millions. $35 billion. $35 billion. Do you know how many people since 1999 have died of an opioid overdose? Five billion. Five billion? No, five. five, Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. We got no people left on the planet. Five million, sorry. uh, Apologies. Close. It's it's a million people. A million people uh, from, from... 1999 to 2001, and those are the ones that they can link um, back to these different opioids, and some of them might have died from other things, so it might actually be higher, but that the, the million is just over a million, I think, at the end of actually 2020. So if they're saying it's like right now, it's like about 50,000 people a year directly linked to opioid overdoses, you know, so it is, it is, over, it is over a million. So it's, it is... It's an, it's it's crazy. And then, you know, like I said, there's all these lawsuits going on, right? So the Sackler family um, were charged and I think found guilty either, or, or I'm sorry, it was Purdue Pharma rather, of different charges, right? So I think in 07 they were charged with something, found guilty under fraud. And um, in 2020 they had a, a similar case. In those In that 13 year gap, because now the big problem is that Purdue Pharma has declared bankruptcy. Okay, like we can't deal with all these lawsuits. Like we declare bankruptcy, but they're a private company. So between 2007 and 2020, they took out of the company and dispersed it to the family $10 billion. Okay, so it's like now, like the, the, They've had to surrender all their interests in Purdue Pharma through these different court actions. But a a judge just threw out the settlement that they reached, a federal judge, because it's like, hey, wait a second. 
you're saying you don't have any money and Purdue Pharma doesn't have any money to fight these court cases and to pay out these court cases. But you guys just took out $10 billion. And that's what's on the, uh, on the record, okay? Mm -hmm. So who knows what they have stashed away in Swiss banks and Cayman Islands and this and that. But they have on paper taken out $10 billion from the company basically just so they can say, we don't, Purdue Pharma, we don't have the money. We don't have it. We better we have to go to bankruptcy court. So they've been in bankruptcy, this bankruptcy court thing for like four years, um, just going grinding through the motions in uh, like this, like local jurisdiction court in White Plains, New York, because they're, they're, that's what their claim is now. And it's uh, fucked. It's like completely, completely fucked. And it's just like, you just, you know, when you watch that dope sick, you're just going to be like, you just can't. Fucking. And there's a lot of this about the Sackler family in there. Oh, yeah. yeah they're, okay. they're, the, whole, the whole show, I would say, they come at it from different angles. Like they feature a doctor from Appalachia. Michael Keaton plays him. Then they have this. Uh, oh, it's like not a doc thing? No, this is a, this is like a docudrama, I oh, would say. So, so it's like OJ versus the people kind of thing? Yes, but done way better okay, okay yeah it's like it's probably the best tv show like i don't i don't the way i've said it on uh, other places is that i've i can't remember the last time i cared about the characters in a show so much hmm. like i was like there are several points where i was like actually distraught from certain scenes like i can't fucking believe really okay, yeah i gotta watch this it's shit. it's so good and um yeah, so like they they've centered so they have one about the doctor that's Michael Keaton. They follow a DEA agent. They follow uh, the the this, this guy Robert Sackler who uh, ended up being the president of president or chairman. He was the highest ranking family member at the company, and he did that on the he got he like kind of did like a, you've seen Succession. Yeah, like he did kind of like a this strategy coup to get that position. And but he did it on the strength of the revenue generated by Oxycontin. So that was Robert Sackler. He's like the main villain, I guess. And a real life, like shitty, awful villain responsible for the deaths of at least a million people. You know, and that's and that like we talk about like it's still a thing. I don't think we've ever done an episode on like uh the Armenian genocide where like Turkey just killed they, they're like it's still like this hot button thing. In Armenia, because Turkey just like, yeah, we didn't do that. But it's like, yes, you did. Like, you killed over a million people. Well, so did Robert Sackler. He's killed. He's responsible for the death, deaths of a million people. And and it's like you, you just, it, it is sickening. And it's like it's sickening the way that like, you know, they they basically just strong, not strong arm, but just coerced and bribed the FDA to like get the, their labels approved. And there's a scene in the show where they're like, we got to get, we got to get Oxycontin into Germany. And Germany has like the strictest regulations for the pharmaceutical industry, maybe because they've been dealing with those Nazis over at Bayer for, for however mm -hmm. long, but they have like very strict uh, rules about what gets approved and what their standards are. And it's very hard to get into Germany. They tried to get into Germany first because they knew that if Germany approved it, even if they later like even six months later, repealed their status for like an you know a prescription drug. Well, it's out the Netherlands, Sweden, France, you know all these other countries in Europe. They would see, well, if Germany approved it, it must be good. So then everybody else would just kind of uniformly get in line and approve it. And it's like, well, and then once it's in these other countries, it doesn't matter if Germany repealed it because their process to have it, you know. To repeal, repeal it is, is, different. is different and much more difficult. Mm -hmm. So they're just like, get it into Germany, and then we got all Europe, and you know, we've we've made thirty five billion, we'll make a hundred billion, and it's just getting people drug addicted, and it's it is so fucked up, and it's just like it just makes you not trust anybody, and it's like if you look through, do you know the pharmaceutical industry has more lawsuits settlements and government levied fines against them than any other industry in like in the world throughout history that's believable though yeah so that's like like i mean dude didn't they fucking johnson and johnson they found out like baby powder was bad for you or something talcum powder yeah, baby yeah, yeah, powder yeah, yeah. like shit like that like that yeah uh pfizer um in 2009 
paid a $2.3 billion settlement uh, for four different drugs with fault under the false claims act. Uh, Johnson and Johnson, 2.2 billion in 2013. Um, same thing, false claims. Abbott Labs, 1.5 billion in 2012. Eli Lilly, 1.4 billion in 2009. All under false claims. So it's like, yeah, our drug does this. It works. It does this. It's safe. It does this. Uh, actually, no, it doesn't. Uh, GlaxoSmithKline, which I've never heard of, but they had a $3 billion lawsuit. Uh, same thing, false claims acts. Um, for the for their these different drugs, we're talking. I mean, the, this is just like Merck, six hundred fifty million. Purdue Pharma, six hundred million. That was for OxyContin in two thousand seven. Um, that's you know the one we're talking about. So it, it's Pfizer, four hundred thirty million in two thousand four for something called Neurotin. Uh, you know, like they just there's like it, like, like the lowest one that's listed here on the on the Wikipedia is for 345 million yeah. Medicare fraud kickbacks on the, on Claritin, believe it or not, over the counter mm. Claritin false That's claims act. Always the big thing too. I read an article. I just pulled it up. I don't know if this is the exact one, but this from the West Virginia Gazette in 2017. Mm -hmm. um, and the amount of painkillers as opposed to the population is always like jarring. Like this one right here says, this a town in West Virginia. I don't know much about it, but it's called Kermit. There's a population of 392 people, mm -hmm. and uh, there were nearly nine million hydrocodone pills over two years to a single pharmacy in that town. Okay, so that's there's another Netflix documentary talking about like that's a very similar thing. So w what ended up happening is that there would be doctors and pharmacists. That, you know, it's almost like, have you ever seen um, Tom Segura's stand-up? I have. But okay, so he, he has this bit where he's talking about, you know, trying to get a medical marijuana card. And he would go, he went into this place and he's like, oh, fuck, like, you know, I have to make up this story. And he was already high, so he's paranoid. And he's like, I really just want weed because I like the way it makes me feel. And then he had this guy coming in after him. And he, so he made up this whole lie about how his eyes hurt. And the doctor's like, yeah, sure, here we go. So then he listened at the door to what the guy behind him said. And the guy behind him says, ah, I just like the way it makes me feel. Okay. So the doctor, hey, here's your, here's your medical marijuana card. That was your California. For this, okay, for, for these drugs, there would be these places in Florida, specifically. Florida was really bad for this. And, um, Louisiana was really bad for this, where they would have doctors and the pharmacy, like basically share a wall, okay? And you would have lines down the street because everybody would know that this is a crooked doctor who will do all, you know, pay him cash, pay him on the side. He'll write you the script. You go down there next, go through the wall, through the door to the pharmacy. They'll fill it for you. And they're just drug dealers, but they have a medical license. So they're able to write scripts. Mm -hmm. And like those, there was this series about this, these people in, uh, outside of New Orleans on, on a docu documentary on Netflix, I'm blanking on the name of it, that this one woman doctor made like millions of dollars prescribing opioids to, to, to drug addicts because they got hooked because they probably went in initially for a legitimate injury or reason, yeah. got hooked. Their normal doctor was like, well, you know, I can't do that. Like I can't just keep prescribing like this, you know, like it's over. Yeah. So they would they do whatever they could. They take these eighteen hour road trips from these different places, end up in Florida, get the drugs they need, go back and sell it, and then, you know, I'll sell my oxycotton and I'll do get the money to buy the heroin because that's cheaper. So you're just you're yeah, you know, and it's just it was it's just so fucked up. Have you ever had any of that? What do you mean? Any of these opioids? Um, I took um when I got my tonsils out. I took the liquid hydrocodone. Okay. So I think that, that is an opioid, but it's not. It's, it's not the same thing? Well, I think it, it is an opioid, but and hydrocodone, I don't know exactly. I don't know enough about that. But I, I, it's just like, you know, when you watch this, these documentaries, you watch this show, and I think back, and, you know, at that time, that's the time when I was playing sports, and I, I had quite a few surgeries. I had a wrist surgery, I had a knee surgery, an ankle surgery, and they would always prescribe that. And... I feel like, but I was young enough that I was at home and like my mom would, you know, I don't really read, you know, especially back then I'm not reading what I'm taking. The doctor says take this, but like my mom was 
like I remember her being very diligent about. Oh yeah, you know that's like, how I, it works, and it's so so like. I easily know. could have ended up like one of these people. Oh yeah, you get yeah. A back surgery, you get something yep. like that. Like you're, yeah, it's horrible. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's 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 very very scary, and the fact that these people are, you know, they had this other the settlement that was thrown out where they originally they were going to donate to these different like advocacy things 4.5 billion but they would not have to acknowledge they would they would not acknowledge any wrongdoing personally themselves so they're like hey here's 4.5 billion but we didn't do it so all these people that are suing us as individuals they can't and so then this judge was reviewing it under appeal and they're like well then you know, because you're in bankruptcy court, that settlement, fuck that settlement. You guys have money. You took out $10 billion over a 13-year period. Yep. And so why would you do that unless you knew that more lawsuits were coming where you would be personally, you know, or the company would be liable? And so they threw that out. So now it's going, as of right now, like they're still going through these various battles and all the people who, you know, accepted gifts and donations from them are like, backpedaling hard so like they had like the tufts university had like sackler building or school of whatever took their name off the sign same thing in oxford where they're like yeah we're not accepting any gifts the met gala same thing they used to don't or the met used to donate to the met every year they're like yeah we're not accepting your donations anymore um you know so it, it got very very bad and they're like toxic now but it's, they're not the only ones like like i said i le- or read through that list like all of these pharmaceutical companies, like I don't know if there's a good one. Like you read this list, and there's like Amgen, Serono, Merck, Allergan, AstraZeneca, Bristol Myers, Sharing Plow, Mylan. You know, like they're Cephalon, Novartis. They're all the and these are the ones that they've been caught. And these are like these are the settlements going back in just the last just a. 2004 so if you go back further than that it's it's just like i don't know how you how, how, what the fuck how can this be happening all the time to this one industry yeah and it and nobody has ever really stepped up to increase regulation and accountability because i think you at some point these companies make so much money that it's just like they're going for the cash grab and then, like, once they get it, like, ah, we'll go to court forever and we're big and powerful and we got everybody in our pockets and we'll try to survive it. Especially if you're, like, a publicly traded company, it's a lot harder. You have to start putting these people in jail. Like, I, I don't see any other way to, to stop it because there's no indication that it's stopping. So it's bad. Yeah, but even now, what kind of jail are they going to? Probably some I, probably some fucking cell in the back of the Met Gala. Or, yeah, you know, CS, yeah. You know. But jail, at some Still. level, I think jail is jail. As long as it's True. not like the Epstein jail where it's like, hey, check in at night if yeah. you feel like it. Yeah. So as long as they go to like a real, even if it's minimum security, but you're going and you stay. But like I don't, uh, these people should be in jail. Like I killed a million people. He should be in jail. But he's not. He's probably on a super yacht somewhere with a gazillion dollars. Because he took it out of the company to avoid and then claimed that he was poor and Purdue Pharma doesn't have any money. Damn, there's a list of institutions here. I'm on their Wikipedia. Mm-hmm. List of institutions bearing the Sackler name. Tufts. Yep. yep. You know. I think they took it down, but yeah. Yeah, they, they did. They closed all everything in Tufts. They closed. But there's a bunch that's still open. And, and if people don't know what Tufts is, Tufts is what they call a small ivy. It's in, in that NESCAT conference. Uh, like nar- my dad went to uh, Bates. Donnie go there. Donnie, Donnie does. I yeah. was thinking Chef Donnie. Donnie does did go to Tufts. Yeah. Big brain. Uh, but Nardini went to a, ne- a Nescac. Like th- it's like a it's a very very good yeah. um, like elite institutions for colleges. So that's Tufts. So what else you got on that list? Um, there's a bunch in London. It seems that are still open. Yep. Uh, Cambridge. Uh, that's in use. Um, Paris, Germany. Paris one's closed. And then uh, some in New York. Yeah. Yeah. It's Guggenheim. The Guggenheim. Yeah. Yep. Crazy. Yeah. Um, all right. That was very informative. That's fucked up. Very informative. So, yeah. It's very fucked up. And, you know, 
obviously goes without saying. It, it, it's affected probably everyone who's listening to this. I think, yeah. Just I think, in some form. I think most so. people um, or probably know, like statistically probably know somebody. Yeah. You know. So if you're going through it, you know, sorry. And yeah. you know, hopefully there's resources for help and whatnot. Yeah, there's probably not enough. And, yeah. and it's like, you know, and this is this goes back to, you know, it's it's such like a complicated thing because now like this fentanyl is is kind of the the main perpetrator, right? And it's like, why is fentanyl on the market? Well, and and heroin is more prevalent out there. Well, it's because the Mexican cartels started seeing their profit margins really cut into when you know all these different states across the country legalized marijuana. So like we're not making money on marijuana because we can't. Why would anybody buy it from us in Illinois, Oregon, California, Washington, Colorado, wherever like they like they used to? So we better start producing other stuff. Let's take a page out of the Sacklers book. We'll get people hooked on opioids. They'll do it forever. And if they you know if they die, they die. They don't give a fuck. And so that's why you're seeing more and more of these fentanyl, heroin, all these like more hardcore drugs becoming more and more prevalent in society is because people got hooked on them. There's demand for it because, you know, Sackler's got people hooked on them, among others. And now there's a demand for it, and they see, like, hey, we're not making what we were used to be making. Let's start producing the things that people we know there's a market for. And and they've been taking advantage of that, and, you know, and more and more people just continue to die. So it's really, really fucked up. It is. And, and one more time, if, you know, we're looking for a guest to kind of – I would love Join to talk to somebody smarter than us. About, yeah, you know, and you know, if you if that person is you know able to share some places around here and whatnot where people can get help, that'd be that'd be fantastic. That so, would be great. Um, but yeah, thanks, Chief. Uh, thanks everybody for listening. Uh, that's going to be it for today. Uh, we we'll, we will be back tomorrow, so we'll uh, we'll see you then.